um, hi Natalie and uh, Amity. Um, can you please unmute yourself? Um, yes. There. Hey Amity, how are you? Hi Ranji. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> All right. Um, Natalie, can you please unmute yourself? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, there. Okay. How are you doing, Natalie? I'm good. Um, can you click on the um, video button again? Um, okay. There oh, we go. Oh, there you go. All right. Can All you right. hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I can see you. Excellent. Hi, Amity. How are you? Hi, Natalie. Great. Good to see you. It's a little early uh, in uh, Seattle right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, friends, um, Natalie Starr is the principal, uh, is a principal at uh, DSM Environmental, and uh, they have recently released a report um, studying all the recycling industries um, in Central Ohio uh, on a, in a report submitted to the Solid Waste Association of Central Ohio. And uh, the reason for the report was um, to study what can be done in um, to develop local markets for recyclables there. Um, and uh, that was really interesting um, uh, for us. And that's why we invited Natalie um, so that she can share that expertise with you. Uh, we also have Amity Lumper. She is a co-president of Cascadia Consulting. And um, she has a, a lot of experience in behavior change and also um, measurements uh, they've or, uh, they recently organized a seminar conference on measurements on um, uh, creating goals and priorities for um, waste management systems in the u.s so um it'll be a great conversation uh, from here on and um so uh, natalie and amity do you have any thoughts on what we've discussed earlier with uh, kate and lynn uh, maybe we could start with that uh, amity yeah, well, I was able to join, as Natalie said, it's a bit early for me, so I was able to join the end of that conversation and I was delighted to hear discussion about marginalized communities and environmental justice issues, um, uh, the individuals, countries, populations being impacted by uh, our waste management practices, uh, being most impacted by, by those practices and uh, also eager to talk about our experience in uh, behavior change uh, in response to some of the questions that were brought up. So, yeah. all right, great. Um, uh, Natalie, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your report and you know the about the recycling industries that you've studied in Central Ohio? Uh, certainly, um, Central Ohio for the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio uh, really wanted to better understand um, all the recycling industries and opportunities for strengthening the circular economy. So, looking at uh, materials from the generator through the collection and processing standpoint where many of us forget about um, where they go after that and to who the end users were and, and making connections with them. So um, they hired DSM. Uh, we did a lot of research and we put together, um, instead of just relying on government data, we put together a list of these industries and tried to identify their economic impact in the region and uh, w which ones were playing bigger roles. Great. Um, Amity, could you tell us a little bit about um, what Cascadia is doing? What are the, your recent projects? Um, yeah, well, as we spoke um, prior to this, Ranji, I mentioned we've been focused for a handful of years now, even before some of these trade challenge, global trade challenges, barriers came up uh, impacting us around goals and metrics and measurement, um, acknowledging that that's where um, we start. Uh, in terms of setting our intentions and setting our directions and um, informing the development of policies and programs in our communities and uh, corporations, campuses, institutions. And so we've been digging into uh, the data because as many of you know, and I'm sure Chaz and others uh, alluded to this uh, earlier and have written on this, we have uh, come to a place where uh, as an industry, we rely so heavily, uh, many of us, uh, on this singular unilateral measure of our success um, and 
the beauty of boiling down uh, our success into one number is great in terms of being able to communicate with our electeds and with the public and our leadership, um, but it's also a real challenge and limiting. And so, you know, this weight-based recycling or diversion uh, percentage you know, this number uh, can tell us a lot, but the, it, there's a lot that it doesn't tell us about how our waste stream is uh, lighter weight, more voluminous, less recoverable, more composites, more multi-layer materials, dramatic, dramatic changes happening uh, today um, and, and have over the last uh, decade in particular, we've seen just rapid uh, change in that material mix coming as inputs into our system, uh, ultimately impact our efficiency to collect that material, to process that material, and to get that material to market. And so uh, we've been looking into other measures of success. We don't want to throw away <laughs> that, that diversion or recycling rate. It's a very important benchmark. We've gotten, uh, according to Cheryl Coleman at the EPA, at this symposium we were able to host last fall on metrics, um, and measurement uh, in partnership with the city of Seattle, really in support of the city of Seattle, uh, asking what what do we look at next for our metrics? Cheryl said, you know, 40 something like 41 of our states have set diversion targets and say that those targets drive uh, their progress. So we know goals and metrics drive our progress. We know there are other ways. Uh, very holistic kinds of ways that folks say with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality looking at uh, mass circularity index. So uh, measuring the materials going into the recycling system, but then also uh, measuring the demand for those materials, uh, actually having them go to market because we know that the greatest environmental benefit happens when we offset the use of virgin inputs by scrap material, uh, the use of scrap material. So biggest impact incorporating that material into new products uh, versus disposal. Right. Uh, and I could say a lot more, but. No, it yeah. makes sense. Um, so uh, that reminds me of um, a discussion point that Cole and Chaz had when they were asked a question, when there was a question from the audience, which is, is single stream recycling uh, you know, inherently bad? And was it something that was pushed by certain uh, parts of the um, society? And I think Chaz um, ended up saying um, that it was inevitable given the, the way we were measuring our, you know, measuring our um, success and uh, the targets that we've um, put together. So I think um, it, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about what kind of measurements or what kind of new uh, measurement ideas were proposed. But before that, let me go to um, Natalie and then ask her about, you know, her report. And Natalie, so um, in your Roger, can I just comment on on that because I I do a lot with measurement too. Would you mind if I comment on that? Go for it. Okay. All I wanted to say was yeah, I agree with Chaz um, in terms of um, it was inevitable because collection costs are such a high portion of our recycling cost. And single stream, what it did for recycling is it allowed us to recycle a lot of materials that could just ride on the the heavier materials or on the paper, um, glass metals that we started with, uh, but what it, it transitioned to was a, a single stream or zero sort uh, in which the public uh, greatly was confused and we started adding in all these multi-materials, uh, multi-material packaging, which has uh, led to a lot of challenges as well as some of the contamination challenges that followed. So um, I, I do think that uh, single stream is a tremendous opportunity. Great. Um, so, Ahri, then, since we're talking about measurements anyways, um, do you want to um, tell us about any uh, recommendations or are there any new measures that, you know, were discussed, which may be the finalists in the future um, sure. that that had the most, you know, um, consensus among the participants of your conference? Sure, I'd be happy to speak to that. I mentioned the mass circularity index. I'd say that's a little further out. Those are the innovators out there pushing the envelope and, and some challenges in uh, measuring what material actually gets captured and directed into end markets in a, a globalized uh, system here. Um, but great great to make that link. Really, we, we're going for that closed loop. Probably an easier next step that we a lot of folks in that workshop gravitated toward, both on the public and the private sector, um, in terms of 
you know, data being readily accessible, easy to communicate to uh, stakeholders, um, relatively easy to measure uh, and meaningful is per capita and, and many jurisdictions and corporations are already measuring these, um, uh, putting some numbers to these metrics per capita waste generation. So, you know, starting with uh, EPA here in the U.S., uh, that's a regular part of their reporting. Uh, again, many states reporting on that. That measures our overall generation of material that's being discarded by residents, uh, by businesses, uh, population centers. And, um, and so, you know, aiming again with the idea that we would reduce our waste uh, or that loss over time and measure all of it, not just the portion that's getting directed to uh, recycling and composting facilities going for overall waste reduction. So those are sort of a couple of metrics on uh, both sides. Uh, right, I think yeah. per capita measurements are really useful. It really changes how we look at multiple states. For example, California, you know, uh, the percentages versus the per capita going to the landfill or going to recycling kind of really makes a difference on how you look at the state and what it's doing. So um, let me uh, go back to the previous question that I had for Natalie, which is, you know, uh, in the report that you've prepared for um, SWA CEO Swaco, um, you say that um, recycling reliant uh, industries provide the most revenue and jobs. So um, can you tell us about what these industries are, what materials do they deal with, and where in the value or supply chain are they? Is all the value reported in the report due to recycling? Yeah, as far as jobs go, it's no surprise they're higher paying jobs um, than collection, processing, and the reuse industries. Uh, because they're the manufacturing industries that used to be the staple of, of our workforce, you know, 40 years ago. Um, in Ohio, there still is a lot of manufacturing, where I just did a study in Rhode Island recently, where there's much less reliant on um, scrap materials. Scrap metal certainly is the biggest contributor from an economic standpoint with, with steel production. I think Ohio might, is the third state in the U.S. of steel production, but also with foundries and these mini mills, um, which are high revenue and high paying jobs, um, followed by paper, plastic, and glass. Um, Ohio, again, is uh, s some of the uh, larger container manufacturers and fiberglass manufacturers who do have a demand for cullet. And uh, Ohio's done a lot of work, specifically Rumpke, to clean up glass from single stream MERS that can make its way to actually a container product or a fiberglass product, which is, um, a lot of cleanup and uh, they've done a great job on it. Um, as far as paper, Ohio still does have uh, in central Ohio, the Baltimore paper mill owned by um, uh, Karastar and then Pratt's building a new mill, which is really exciting. That's going to pr um, produce uh, container board from 100% recycled uh, paper. So closing the loop there with those industries where you can have the generator in the region and you can have the processor in the region and you can have the end user there is, pre is pretty exciting and identifying them and, and finding ways to strengthen those partnerships um, is really what the circular economy, the best example of it, and we can find it in Ohio. Right, that, that's um, really useful. And um, before I um, jump on to the next question um, with Amity about um, being a woman-owned business, you know, which is a topic that you know we've been talking about, uh, because at B Waste Wise, we believe that it's not just technological changes, but our, our problems have all kinds of solutions, which include social and technological changes. So we'll talk about that. But before that, let me just remind you that um, my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a senior waste management consultant. I'm also a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. And um, we, uh, we're, to, um, now we're talking with Amity Lumper from Cascadia, Cascadia Consulting and Natalie Starr from DSM Environmental. And if you have any questions, use the, um, use the live chat I'm, I'm forgetting what to say. Uh, use the live chat um, uh, option below the video stream and um, send any questions and comments. Um, so don't wait until the last minute. In the previous conversation, we got three questions in one minute and we can you know, respond to all of those. So don't wait until then, send the questions and comments right away. And, um, and um, again, um, I'm, I'm joining from India, a slight change in plans. So we have a festival coming up um, in two weeks, but you know, I think the preparations have already started. There'll be a lot of background noise. If you hear anything, you know why, uh, you know what it is. Um, so um, with that, Andy, do you, do you want to talk about being a woman-owned business um, in the sector? 
Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I was uh, talking with Ranjit last week. It was so wonderful to see all of the uh, female faces on the advertisements and marketing for this event, including you, Natalie, um, and uh, notice some other co-presidents uh, at Eureka. And so uh, excited that Cascadia here, we've got this model um, of uh, being two female co-presidents. We transitioned uh, from our founders to male founders, wonderful people who uh, really worked hard to build a great culture and great company, very mission driven. Um, we've, we're celebrating our 25th year and in 2015 was when we made the transition to majority women owned and operated business. Um, and it's been wonderful. We certainly see it as a competitive advantage in some markets. Um, Cascade has always been female uh, dominant in terms of our employee base, majority female. Uh, so it fits uh, for us. And, um, and I would say it's been interesting, uh, just the approach we've taken to policies, uh, to how we take care of our workforce, to the kind of office we're, uh, office workplace uh, we're creating here, the culture we're creating here, um, and really finding that employees are also embracing this idea of being a women-owned um, business, so women business enterprise, and um, we're excited about it. Great, wonderful, thanks, um, Hamati. And um, Natalie, so can I ask you about um, the listing that you've created for um, Swapo? Um, friends, we are covering a lot of um, topics and we only have 45 minutes. So we'll go from one to the other very quickly. Um, so um, Natalie, can you talk about the listing that you've created? Um, and once you have the listing of all the recycling reliant industries, then what do you do next to move towards a more, um, you know, better recycling system or more circular um, waste management system? Sure. Well, I, well, what Swaco wanted was a database that listed all the companies. I think that it's a work in progress in terms of constantly updating that database. One thing about recycling industries is uh, in some industries they come and go. We've seen a lot of entry and exit by electronics recyclers, certainly, as is the case with some other recyclers of specialty materials. Um, but I think what Swaco's goal in the end is, is to do what they can on the market development side so that they help connect generators with end users and help to better define what the specifications are for those uh, products, the end users uh, feedstock, and how can they move materials uh, up to the end user and how can they play a role in that. And I think that's, um, that's a big step for a, uh, someone involved in, in waste and just collection of recycling to try and look at it in that way. Right, great. Um, and from there, we'll go to the next question um, with Amity. Amity, could you talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the West Coast um, where you're really active and, you know, um, give us an idea of, you know, the diversion options and, and their status? Well, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, you know, we, it's interesting uh, being on the West Coast in a city that has invested heavily in recycling programming and infrastructure and policies. I'm here in Seattle, as Ranju mentioned, um, and we work in the Bay Area and so get, get the privilege of working in these communities that have made long-term investments in recycling and waste reduction and made a lot of progress. And based on those, some of those traditional metrics we talked about, measures of success are really seeing a plateau in performance. But as we look a little deeper in those numbers, there continues to be great progress. And in fact, I was just looking in preparation for this uh, today, looking at some of our recent uh, clients' reports uh, from Seattle, from San Francisco, from Cal Recycle, uh, from Palo Alto, looking across uh, the West Coast, and then as well as some, some uh, communities back East. And um, it's, it, it, some of the numbers are staggering. I mean, upwards of 90% capture of cardboard, of yard waste for composting, of uh, high-grade paper, um, but then also surprising to see uh, still in some of those communities, uh, fairly low 
capture rates for aluminum cans, a quintessential recyclable. Uh, how are we only capturing 15% of aluminum cans uh, in these communities that have been investing in recycling and where recycling is really a part of the norm and uh, people want to be perceived in these communities uh, as environmental stewards for the most part. That's the dominant culture, the social norms uh, happening here. And yet still we've got huge opportunities for improvement, particularly around organics. Uh, we've focused a lot here at Cascadia on organics, uh, also focusing a lot on textiles, uh, both of those still disposed in very large quantities, lots of room for diversion and high impact uh, potential. Uh, takes a lot of resources to make those materials um, to produce our food and there's still much of it that, that's going to waste. So happy to talk more about that later as well. So bottom line, we've made great strides and we've got a lot of opportunity left. And of course, we're being most impacted uh, by uh, some of these uh, trade barriers in, in China and other parts of Asia right now. And so it's really a, a, an awakening. Uh, there's a reckoning and an awakening happening uh, right now around those goals, around those measure, measures of success and around what's next beyond uh, 2020 goals, for example. Right. Um All right, my bad. Um, Natalie, so um, Amity mentioned textiles, and um, you've done um, a, list, a listing of all recycling reliant industries. So um, talk to me about textiles, the numbers, the logistics, and you know how that recycling works. Well, uh, it, textiles is certainly not my specialty as a material, but I do know a bit about it, having worked in, in the recycling industry for 25 years. Um, Certainly, the, the, there was some decline in the market. The price um, I heard in Rhode Island of a buyer uh, price being one fifth of what it was, say, a year ago or 18 months ago, um, but still a demand for textiles. And as Amity mentioned, certainly there's uh, probably pretty low recovery rate. Um, textiles going to reuse on a local level, obviously, is a lot of where the capture goes and also the placement of boxes all over the place. But the boxes are placed in, in places where there's a high population. And often textile recycling doesn't reach the more rural populations, nor does it capture the kind of, and have the kind of recovery rates as cardboard or some other materials do. Um, that's compounded by the fact that we are buying at, at an ever increasing rate. I just read an article in the Atlantic about online buying and uh, 7.4 pairs of shoes per American per year. I'm not sure where that statistic came from, but it, that's pretty staggering. Um, and so, so um, it's going to be an ongoing challenge in figuring out a way that we can recover higher rates. But I think it really comes down to um, uh, some talking about the circular economy, um, having more quality, long-lasting products, which is something tough, tough to talk about because globally now people can afford uh, to buy new clothes and cheap clothes and uh, having access to clothes that they never have had before. Um, so it's a balance. But here in the United States, certainly there's a lot of innovation with companies that are not only setting up online marketplaces for buying um, used clothing, like Patagonia is a, a great example. There's REI has a, an outlet now with, with used clothes. Um, as well as selling more durable clothes so that the cycle is a lot longer. Um, so I think all those things play into, into having, as, um, as I said, the circular economy work. Um, um, great. I mean, um, that, that reminds me of multiple um, issues. For example, you spoke about consumption and, um, and uh, we've had multiple panels on con con consumption earlier. And um, uh, in one of the panels with um, uh, a Pratt Institute professor Carl Zimmering, um, we kind of agreed that it's it's a on a global level it's a balance between affordability and access and um, you know sustainability. But um, but coming to this um, uh, this this uh, discussion, Amity, could you talk to us about behavior change um, and you know? Uh, when we talk about behavior change or when we talk about change in general, um, you know, we don't include, uh, in most discussions, but we don't include the aspect of time in it. So could you talk to us about behavior change and, the, and you know, talk to us about it in, on a time scale? 
I so appreciate you asking the question about time because as I indicated to you earlier, it is often the bigger constraint. <laughs> uh, there are resources certainly needed to um, design, implement, evaluate behavior change programs uh, effectively, but often time in our experience is the more limiting factor. And so I would just as a general rule of thumb, I'd say we uh, recommend clients give at least six months to a year minimum to see if a new behavior or a changed and adaptive behavior takes hold. Um, of course, if we're applying the uh, community-based social marketing sort of social science principles, um, we do a lot of work in community-based social marketing and have folks uh, trained, practitioners trained in that space. I've had an opportunity to receive some of that training myself. And um, if we follow that to a T, the, the time requirements are even longer uh, to really go through a scientific process to identify indivisible discrete behaviors that you wanna affect, to identify related barriers that you need to uh, lower um, perceived or real barriers with that behavior uh, to get the right infrastructure in place. So often we're finding just the collection infrastructure, uh, you know, having that be intuitive and accessible and consistent uh, is important um, and then sustaining uh, engagement and education over time uh, with those populations is important too. It's not a one and done uh, situation where we go out and make a big splash and do a campaign and call it done. It's human behavior is complex, it changes. We're really trying to affect broader societal social norms um, and it takes time and resources and that sustained engagement over time. Um, right, and um, one question I had uh, related to that is, um, uh, can you talk about how deep behavior change can go, um, you know, when you do it over, let's say, 40 years or maybe uh, five, uh, 50 years um, in the U.S. Um, of consistent messaging about recycling? And um, can you talk to us about that and how it's related to the recycling rate? Can we go any further with behavior change? Well, as an example, I was mentioning earlier um, for communities that have made those investments uh, or companies that have made those investments over 10, 20, 30 years, we are seeing uh, capture rates, recycling rates uh, upwards of 70% here in Seattle, 75% of all our single family and multifamily residential waste is diverted for recycling and composting. Now that doesn't mean that all uh, ends up in, in a market. We know there's loss along the way, but that's the material that's being captured at the curb. Um, and so just one example uh, here. All right, um, uh, Natalie, um, so, well, before I ask you the question, let me just remind everyone. So uh, my name is Ranjit Anipu, co-founder of Be Waste Wise. We are here with Amity Lumber, Cascadia Consulting, and Natalie Star, DSM Environmental. And um, Amdi, uh, sorry, um, Natalie. So, could you uh, um, you've you've um, created a census of uh, recycling industries, which is you know a promising start to our zero waste aspirations. Um, how do we build on your work further, and where do we look for information, and who are some partners that can be leveraged, you know, for gathering this kind of information for on a, on a scale? I guess I think ideally, if we had that census uh, in North America and we all utilized it better. Certainly now is the time when we're being cut off from markets overseas. We need to strengthen and develop relationships with our markets here at home. And uh, it, many of which who do have the capacity to take the material, some of which need to still be developed um, and be able to determine what their, uh, what their needs really are in terms of, as I was saying before, material specifications, what we need to clean up to, what we need to provide for them. And, and you know, maybe, collect that, maybe rethink recycling a little bit. What, what has happened a lot is that we keep wishfully, as everyone says, wishful recycling, added materials to the stream where the markets are uh, slim to none and ex hope that those mixed bales of materials can make their way eventually to, to a market. And that, that's a really tough way to do recycling as opposed to what's the demand for what materials. Um, we need to do both, but as you asked about a census for for these industries, I think would be a 
great thing to do um, on a state by state or a national level. Um, we used to do a lot of recycling market development, say 20 years ago in the United States, EPA was very involved with grants. Um, certain states developed institutes, Massachusetts had one, um, worked a lot with plastics. Um, a lot of these programs have dried up and gone away and we became more and more reliant on sending our materials overseas and kind of forgetting about them. And uh, that has come at a cost now. Um, so. I, I think it's a good next step. Great. Um, thanks, Natalie. So um, let me just remind everyone that um, we have only 15 minutes to go um, for our panel with Amity and um, Natalie. So if you have any questions, use the live chat window below the video stream and put them um, to us. And um, earlier we were talking about al aluminum and um, its um, recycling or recovery percentage. Um, and um, in the next session, we have Beth Schmidt, who's worked for uh, an aluminum um, company, and she knows all about that and um, how that uh, or, or what that means to the rest of recyclables. So we'll, we'll talk about it then. Uh, but Andy, um, so c can you talk about, you know, um, uh, um, let me just get it from here. Um, in our in our test run, you mentioned that um, corporates and, uh, set goals uh, based on what cities do. So, um, could you uh, talk about the kinds of stakeholders that are involved um, in that will be involved in the new systems uh, for North America, new recycling systems for North America? I think I understood the I understood the first part of the question. The second part, I'm not sure, but I'll do my best here. Um, yeah, so I mentioned to Ranjit that it's we're seeing it be the case, uh, and particularly before the advent of, say, true certification and uh, Zero Waste Business Council, and there's been a lot of progress there to help in goal setting and standard setting and verification around zero waste uh, in corporate settings and business settings um, by those groups and in those certifications. So there's been a lot of progress there. Before uh, that those systems came to be, uh, many of our corporate clients were taking notes, you know, referencing um, cities who had uh, taken the lead historically on goal setting and uh, measurement and tracking um, around recycling and waste reduction. And so just recognizing the impact Again, it's setting those goals and setting those metrics has even beyond your own jurisdiction or beyond your or, or own organization, particularly if you're successful. Others are looking to you, um, uh, no matter your sector, for you know how do they set goals and what kind of progress might they expect and how do they what are the measurement systems to set up to understand their progress toward those goals. Um, is that does that respond to your question, Ronti? No, it does. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Great. Um, for yeah, th thanks for that. Um, Natalie, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the industry right now? Um, how do the new systems? Um, how might the new systems for North America look like? Where is the most innovation happening, or where is the most movement happening at this point? Well, I think certainly we're seeing a lot of corporations take a much bigger role in in terms of the whole um, material cycle, the products they put out there. There's a lot of interest uh, in um, having a sustainable brand, and there's uh, sustainability metrics that many corporations now hold to or report on, uh, or, and if they don't, uh, they're thinking about it. Um, that's a big change in the last 20 years, even the last 10 years. Um, what they do with it is, is remains to be seen. They may be good at producing or putting something out there, um, there was for a long time a big disconnect between the manufacturers themselves and the recycling industries. Manufacturers being producing a very clean and pristine product and the recycling industries dealing with uh, in the past a lot of waste and still now with uh, some of our single stream facilities seeing higher and higher contamination rates. So how we bring these two together um, and so that we, we keep the end product a little cleaner and that we give the industries a better understanding of um, as they say, design for recycling, putting a product out there that has a better chance of making it back into another product as opposed to what we do is downgrade or downcycle of most of our materials. Um, so I do think that we're seeing a lot of progress. I think um, 
I think we're all anxious. This is a difficult time um, right now with markets, as Amity alluded to on the West Coast and certainly on the East Coast too. Um, we have a lot of work to be done and um, everybody needs to understand also that recycling costs money. We've, we've definitely put materials out there, called them a waste and expected a landfill to take care of them or waste energy or incinerator at a low cost. And uh, now we're separately collecting them and trying to manage them and all of that comes at a cost and we all have to be willing to to pay the price. But in the long run, if we figure it out, we're gonna be better off. Uh, right, um, Chaz has mentioned this earlier, um, Kate and Lynn, all of them mentioned that, uh, you know, th there's a, a recognition now um, in the public that uh, recycling is a service and that it costs money. Um, so that's very interesting hearing from you too. And, um, um, Andy, so um, Natalie was talking about how, you know, there, there's, there have been certain changes in the past 20 years. Uh, what do you think about the pace of change, um, you know, that has happened until now and what's happening right now? Do, do you think the movements are different um, now and do you think these will last longer? Yeah, good question. I think this shift we're hearing from quantity to quality, I mean, we sort of have to have sufficient quantities of materials to sell as feedstock into a market and have that be economical, right? Supply and demand. Um, but we have to have quality material. And so I just seen that the, the quality piece being underscored now, and I don't see that going away. I think we're going to have to make dramatic, speaking of pace of change, I think pretty quickly, dramatic investments and changes to our system. Some of those are already happening. Um, uh, it's complex. Those timelines are often tied up in contracts between service providers and communities. Um, and so depending on where they're at in those cycles and the tolerance that ratepayers have to contribute funds uh, to invest in these systems, I mean, there's, there's, it's really up to our public, uh, the public uh, and those stakeholders to, to buy in. And it's up to us to remind them why <laughs> this is a public good, um, why public health, um, all the socioeconomic um, pieces, um, very, very important here. So I think we're gonna have to move pretty quickly. Um, I think it's complex. Uh, we'll see different right. paces of change depending on, on where you're at. Yeah. Right, no, uh, makes sense. And um, working as a waste management consultant, I've seen this um, across many different regions, which is the type of change or the final system um, really depends on the kinds of stakeholders that are involved or are driving the change. Um, you know, if it's um, coming from a government, it tends to be more top down. If it's coming from the community, um, it tends to be more bottom up. And then that makes sense. But of course, there are exceptions to all of this. Um, and um, so, since you're talking about the pace of change, could you also tell us how new systems might look when it comes to measurements and um, also when it comes to behavior change communications? Yeah, new systems, I automatically go to technology. And of course, we're working on both sides of trying to leverage all the awesome, fantastic, capable technology and talk about being released at a rapid pace from you know, sensors, providing real time uh, feedback and facilitating dynamic routing and logistics for the collection of materials. Uh, we've had challenges applying those models here in the US, but uh, certainly have taken hold in Europe and parts of Asia and see that uh, kind of technology expanding in, in the US and in North America. I think robotics offer some very interesting um, options for us that I could see when deployed in the right ways. And we're already seeing some of this uh, with the innovators out there in this space, uh, improving worker safety, improving efficiency, uh, and again, changing those economics um, in terms of efficiently processing material uh, to be a feedstock for remanufacturing. Um, so a lot of really exciting technological uh, advancements and then, you know, on the back end, capturing energy and value uh, from, from plastics. Um, Agilex down the road from us here in Oregon, uh, been doing some interesting things with plastics over the years, deriving value and energy and uh, oil products. So um, 
there's a lot, a lot of innovation happening, excited and, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So we're in a place where um, we're feeling the constraints acutely and uh, I think it's driving unparalleled innovation. It's exciting. Great. Um, thanks, Auntie. Uh, Natalie, do you have any um, key messages that we've left out in the discussion that you would like to talk about? Well, I was just going to add to that. I mean, uh, Amy alluded to earlier about new ways to measure and standardize measurement being a per capita generation. And then we've been talking about recovery rates. And I think those two key factors, what's the recovery rate for the materials that we're putting out there and having that information, not at a municipal or city level, but at a state level, uh, looking at waste composition and then looking at measuring what are we really capturing, recycling, and is it going to market um, are, are two key things and different from a recycling rate, which is weight based and very much gets confused by the types of materials that you measure, scrap metal and yard waste being very heavy and influencing the rates and differences between regions. But again, looking back at what are the materials that we're putting out there in the waste stream? What are we generating? And what is the recovery rate of these materials? How can we do better? And standardizing the measurement year to year, not, not changing it, um, are probably important things to think about. Um, and as far as technology, I mean, onboard scales, there's a lot of different things out there that we didn't have 10, 20 years ago that will change the way that we measure what we do at a more site or location basis. Uh, for companies, I know companies are much more interested in how they're doing in terms of putting waste out there. Are they recovering most of their waste and um, having measurements again at a, a corporate level across all locations or at one location, which is, which is a, a big change. Great, thanks, Natalie. Um, um, Andy, any um, closing remarks, um, key messages that we've, we haven't already covered? I don't think so. More of this. Keep doing more of this. I think the global dialogue, your mission around knowledge transfer and consistent education over time leading to that long-term change that we need to see is critical. So I'm excited to see more of this and coming together as an industry and across the recycling value chain. I think it's, um, it's inspiring. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much, Amity. I really appreciate that. Um, friends, um, at Be Waste Wise, I mean, we really believe that uh, uh, change can happen from any part of the society, irrespective of um, the region, the profession, or age, or gender, or any that kind of um, um, differences. Um, so uh, we've been um, bringing uh, people who are looking for solutions in contact with people who can focus provide those solutions. Generally, the only mechanism to do this is through long PDF reports. Uh, I wrote a thesis which was 200 pages, lo pages long, and I know that decision makers will not read through those 200 pages before uh, making a decision. Uh, uh, decision making, and um, at least in the cities, is like firefighting. And we have to think about how much time they have, um, how much time we have um, in getting our message across. So uh, we've been um, organizing these webinars so that they, uh, they could get in touch with people who can provide solutions. And also they have a content which they could easily consume and um, easily access. So um, in, in 2013, we've organized about eight events. That's when we started. And this year we've organized 35 events. And next year, that's about um, uh, one event every week and a half. Um, next year, we're trying to get um, closer to one event every week which will make us one of the largest uh, platforms out there for knowledge um, dissemination through video. Um, and uh, we've been doing events um, ranging from panels to interviews and various time durations. Um, so with that, um, thank you for um, joining us, um, Natalie and Amity, and um, wish you all the best with your work. And with that, I'll hide you from the broadcast and I'll bring Beth and Jim onto the broadcast. Great, thank you, Ranti. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.